couple years ago, Monty and I sat down to watch House of Cards on Netflix. We were on our favorite couch, I'd turned off the lights, and we started the show. The first episode of House of Cards starts with screeching tires, a collision, and then the sound of a whimpering dog. At this point, Kevin Spacey's character, Frank Underwood, comes out of his house and approaches the injured animal. Now, Monty was clearly upset by all this. He was huddled all the way over at the other end of the couch, sort of looking kind of uncomfortable. But I figured everything's going to be fine, right? Frank Underwood, as the lead character, is going to do what lead characters always do when they're introduced to the audience. He's going to do something noble and courageous, like protect and save the injured animal. But then Frank Underwood did something totally unexpected. He bent down, spoke directly to the camera, and strangled the dog, right? So this was too much. I had to turn off the show, turn back on the light, so I wouldn't permanently scar my friend Monty. <laughs> um, why might this be bad for entertainment? After all, ever since we've had televisions, people have been turning them off for all sorts of reasons. The reason this might be bad for entertainment is that today Netflix knows exactly when Monty and I turned the television off. And the fear of some in the industry is that Netflix is going to combine that information with information about millions of other viewers and then start to use data and algorithms to make creative decisions. For the past 10 years, my colleague Rahul Talang and I have conducted research at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College working with the major publishing houses, major record labels, and major studios to use data and analytics to understand how technology is changing their business. A couple years ago, we decided to write a book. It's called Streaming, Sharing, Stealing, Big Data and the Future of Entertainment. And in it, we're trying to summarize what we've discovered in our research. We learned an awful lot about when we, when we were writing the book. The first thing we learned is that writing a book is really hard. As academics, we're used to writing 30-page research papers. So when we sat down with our editor at MIT Press, and she said that the book should be eh, 200, maybe 250 pages long, we looked at each other, did the math, and said, huh, sounds like if we write seven 30-page research papers, we ought to be done. How hard could that be? And the answer is, you're an idiot. Writing a book is nothing like writing seven different papers. The reason it's different is that the publisher expects you to tell a story, and storytelling is incredibly hard. And the painful realization for just how difficult storytelling is gave us a new appreciation for the many powerful and wonderful storytellers in the publishing, music, and movie business, and how much we all benefit from the wonderful work they do. And it also gave us a renewed passion for understanding whether technology might be damaging their opportunities to bring great stories to the audience. And many of our friends in the industry are worried that it is. In television and movies alone, we've seen an explosion in new creative output, much of it from Silicon Valley, not Hollywood. Think Orange is the New Black, Transparent, or my personal favorite, Stranger Things. And staying things in this industry are just getting stranger. In the past year, Netflix announced that it was tripling its output of original programming. Amazon announced plans for 12 original movies per year on its platform. And Google announced YouTube Red with plan plans for 10 original movies of its own. Carlton Cuse, the Emmy Award-winning showrunner, used a sports analogy to describe why this might be bad for entertainment. This explosion in output, in his view, is similar to what would happen if the NFL suddenly expand, expanded to have 90 teams. You'd have a whole lot more football available to you, but the overall quality of it would be diluted. But if big data is hurting entertainment, then why are the big data firms winning so many awards for their original shows? Netflix has received 133 Emmy nominations, including 54 Emmy nominations this year alone. And at last year's Golden Globes, Amazon and Netflix received more nominations than the top four broadcast networks combined. 
And it's not just critics who are happy with the output of Silicon Valley. Kevin Spacey himself called his experience making House of Cards with Netflix the most fun and most creatively rewarding experience I've ever had in front of the camera. Creativity, it would seem, is actually thriving in the hands of the new data-driven companies. And to understand why, let's take the advice of Senator Frank Underwood and take a step back, look at the bigger picture. Let's start with the fear that Netflix might be using data and algorithms to make creative decisions. This is a perfectly reasonable concern given the established practices in the industry. Prior to Netflix, companies made green lighting decisions in a room full of industry veterans. These experts used their years of experience to estimate how many people were likely to watch a show. Then they used their beliefs about audience behavior to give the creators notes telling them which scenes should be cut so as to retain the audience and make the best use of the scarce broadcast slots. Given how prevalent these practices are in the industry, it's natural to assume that Netflix would simply use its data to replicate these processes. But taking a step back, it's clear that Netflix isn't using its data to replicate existing industry processes. Instead, they're using their data to create a whole new set of processes. Consider the green lighting process. Many in the industry have concluded that Netflix was able to see the potential for House of Cards before anyone else in the industry because it was able to look into its data and discover that there were many fans of Kevin Spacey's acting, David Fincher's directing, and many fans of the BBC's House of Cards. But that can't possibly be what net gave Netflix an advantage in greenlighting House of Cards, can it? After all, everybody in the industry already knew that Kevin Spacey and David Fincher had huge followings and that the BBC's House of Cards was a huge hit. Netflix's advantage didn't come from knowing how many fans of Kevin Spacey existed in the audience. Netflix's advantage come, came from doing something that no traditional broadcast network could copy. It came from knowing exactly who those fans were and its ability to promote content to them directly based on their individual preferences. Netflix's platform also changed how content is made. Let's go back to the first scene of House of Cards that I described earlier. At the 2014 Aspen Ideas Festival, head writer Bo Williman said that this scene was extremely controversial among many of the TV veterans on his creative team. They said, you can't kill the dog. You're going to lose half your viewership in the first 30 seconds. So Williman went, went to David Fincher and said, hey, man, are, are you worried that we're going to lose half our viewership if we include this scene? And Fincher said, I don't give a shit. And Williman said, I don't either, so they left the scene in. That level of creative freedom would have been almost unthinkable in a traditional broadcast environment. On the same Aspen Ideas panel, Disney veteran Michael Eisner said that if he had tried to include a similarly violent scene in an episode of broadcast television, the head of the network would call me, the president of the company would call me, I'd be out in 10 minutes. Why did the scene work for Netflix, but not for broadcast television? First, Netflix wasn't pursuing an advertising-driven business model, so it didn't have to worry about offending advertisers by including a potential controversial scene. Second, and maybe more important, Netflix doesn't face the same scarcity in broadcast capacity that the traditional networks do. In a traditional network, you can only broadcast one show at a time, so that show has to appeal to as many viewers as possible. But a Netflix subscriber who was offended by Kevin Spacey's actions was able to choose from hundreds and thousands of other shows on Netflix. And in fact, by seeing how people responded to the scene, Netflix was able to gather important information about their preferences. Monty and I don't like it when dogs get strangled, and apparently you do. And, and that's okay, I'm not judging. Freak. <laughs> and this brings us back to the other concern about data-driven programming, that too much content could actually be bad for the quality of entertainment, in the same way that too many NFL teams could be bad for the quality of football. Again, this is a perfectly reasonable analogy given how the business has always worked, right? In a world of scarce broadcast slots, 
the winner is the show with the most viewers, and everybody who subscribes to Nielsen's ratings knows the score. But Netflix is playing a completely different game. To win, Netflix doesn't have to find more viewers for its individual shows. Netflix wins by finding more shows that have the unique characteristics to meet the unique interests of their individual viewers. In the end, Frank Underwood was right. Power is a lot like real estate. The closer you are to the source, the higher your property values. The problems for our friends in the entertainment industry is that technology has shifted the source of power in their industry and reduced the value of many of their existing properties. For the last hundred years, the source of power in the entertainment industry has been the ability to control how content was created and distributed. The problem today is neither of those scarce resources are as scarce as they once were. The scarce resource today is audience attention. And the new source of power in the business is the ability to control the data necessarily to, necessary to manage that attention and also control over the platform necessary to collect that data. So that's our insight. The question is how to share it. And here's where things get really difficult. You see, the hardest part about writing this book wasn't the storytelling. It was knowing that this insight would actually be deeply offensive to many of our friends in the industry. No one likes to hear that their business might be in danger or that the strategies they've always used to succeed might need to change. And at many points while writing this book, Rahul and I looked at each other and said, are we really sure we want to say this? Wouldn't it be easier just to keep our mouths shut, mind our own business, and continue doing the academic research we love doing? What Rahul and I discovered is that the key to this brings us back to the theme of tonight's conference. Insight, insight. How do you take an insight you might have and use it to bring about change in someone else's life? What we discovered while writing the book is that the key to that is two things. It's having the courage to tell the truth, but doing it with a compassion that comes from a singular desire to see the other person succeed. In the end, big data isn't killing creativity. It's actually enhancing it. And that's great news for all of us because it means we're always going to be able to find content just for us, no matter who you are. Thank you.